Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembrick. And I'm Janice. And this program is called Quick Study Television, taking you through the Bible in one year. Now, as we do that, we are landing in the midst of the prophetic books. Today, we begin the book of Ezekiel. It is an excellent time to explore this fascinating prophet. Corey, what's up? Well, I'm going to be focusing in on the man Ezekiel and his time period. Very good. That is excellent. Now, you studied today. Yes. What did you do? We're going to talk a little bit about the phrase, son of man. Excellent. Very good. And Ryan is here to tell us what he's doing. Ryan? Today, I attempt to answer this Bible question. Was King Jehoiachin released from prison on the 25th day of the 12th month, as Jeremiah says, or was he released on the 27th day of the 12th month, as 2 Kings says? Oh, that's a good question, a possible Bible conflict. We'll talk about that. Also, get your Bible guides out because this prophet is a reluctant prophet, again, like many of them. Stay there. are going to be focusing in on the prophet Ezekiel as a person, as a man. Uh, we know uh, from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel a few things about his life. One of those things being that he is a prophet of God in exile, which is quite unusual, and it's, it's a newer thing for his time period. Uh, a lot of exiles have gone into exile before the full destruction of Jerusalem. Take a look. Historically and traditionally, the authorship of the ancient book of Ezekiel is credited to the prophet Ezekiel himself. The records of his many visions and prophecies were written in an extremely consistent style, and more than any other biblical prophet, Ezekiel dated his prophecies. Thirteen times a passage in Ezekiel opens up with a reference to the year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, the Judean king with whom Ezekiel went into captivity. Ezekiel was from a priestly family and was taken as an exile from Jerusalem when he was 25 years old. This exile was the second of three deportations that Babylon would impose on ancient Judah. Five years later, when Ezekiel reached 30 years old, the age that he would have begun serving in the temple, he tells his readers that God called him to be a prophet. The main focus of the first portion of Ezekiel is the impending fall of Jerusalem. Ezekiel did everything from record his visions of it, explain why it was going to happen, as well as to dramatically act it out in front of the other Judean exiles. When the news of Jerusalem's destruction comes to the prophet, recorded in Ezekiel chapter 33, the text switches first to court rulings against various nations, and second to the hope of God's restoration of a reunited Israel. This great hope of Ezekiel is exemplified by the prophecies about a return of the exiles to the promised land, the coming of the Messiah and reestablishment of the Davidic line of kings as well as a miraculous change in people's hearts, from the old, stubborn, hard hearts and minds to new hearts that desire to follow God. Many commentators have also recognized that the book of Ezekiel has some in common with the New Testament book of Revelation, particularly in their introductions and endings. The appearance of Christ in Revelation has intriguing correlations with the visions of God in Ezekiel, and both books end with mentions of a life-giving river flowing from the presence of God. So there we have it, a, a brief but hopefully a thorough enough study for you to begin uh, appreciating the time period of the prophet Ezekiel. Now, this time period, we've talked about it a lot because he was a contemporary of the prophet Jeremiah, but uh, what's really interesting about Ezekiel is that we get it from a completely different perspective. So we have the word of God coming uh, to Jeremiah in Jerusalem to the royal court uh, and the Judeans who are left 
left in Jerusalem and they're still left with hope because as long as Jerusalem's alive, as long as it has some political freedom, as long as there's people living there, uh, they have hope that God will bring restoration or they will somehow earn restoration or independence from Babylon. On the other hand, we have uh, exiles already living in Babylon uh, with their exiled king, Jehoiachin, who is mentioned uh, by Ezekiel a couple of times. Uh, and, and so the atmosphere is different among these exiles. They're wondering what's going to happen. Is the, is the rest of the community going to be exiled with us? Are we ever going to be able to return to Jerusalem? Was there something about us? Uh, so Ezekiel is prophesying to the exiles from this standpoint. Uh, so what's really interesting about that is we have uh, two prophets of God both saying essentially the same thing, but they're saying it in a different way and with a different bent because of their audiences. So I find it very interesting to read these books back to back and compare them. You know, just when we thought that God was done, miles away, God ordains another prophet to speak to the people of Judah who were exiled in Babylon. Ezekiel was that man. He would make no friends, but he would make God's word known to the people. While living at the Chebar Canal, Ezekiel was instructed by God, quote, you shall speak my words to them whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious, close quote. Chapter two, verse seven. The reluctant prophet, son of Buzzai, was a priest living in the foreign land. The temple of God would be destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar. Ezekiel spoke of many mysteries at the end of his ministry. For example, the war of Gog and Magog, the description of the new temple. Well, these are just two of the strange things about which Ezekiel prophesied. Ezekiel 2, verses 1 through 10. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. Then the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet, and I heard him who spoke to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day, for they are impudent and stubborn children. I'm sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. Then he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning and woe. Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. A man named Ezekiel is stunning. He is a great prophet and he is a prophet of God. And he lives at the river Kibar, which is a kind of canal from Babylon. 
Now, this is interesting, and we are going to begin his book today. We are going to study the book of Ezekiel. This is fascinating. Get your Bible guide out. If you don't have one, you can write to us at one of our three addresses. We'd be happy to send it to you if you would be kind enough to put in an offering in any amount. The offerings are very important right now as we try to catch up. Uh, in the summertime, it's very difficult. Or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com. Biblediscoverytv.com. And when you go there, click on donate, make a donation. It'll take you to the PDF files. Or uh, we'll, we can send you a Bible guide when you ask for one. Now, Ezekiel is somebody who is fascinating. I, I love this guy. This is great. And in our Works of Faith segment, I like to say a reluctant prophet... Yes, he was a reluctant prophet. In fact, we read Ezekiel's 1 to 4, and as we do that, we begin to get into his mind because God is talking to us. We're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would help us to hear you today. As we study the man Ezekiel, we study your prophet. Touch the people who are listening and help them to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 says, And he said to me, quote, Son of man, stand on your feet. I will speak to you, close quote. And then the Spirit, capital S, entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet. And I heard him who spoke to me. And he said to me, quote, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. In fact, they and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day, for they are impotent and stubborn children. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. Wow, that's intense. This is amazing because God speaks to us. God always makes his voice clear when we are in trouble. Many times we don't hear him because we are lost in our sin. I mean, I run into people all the time as a pastor. It's fascinating. And people come to me and they say, well, Pastor Rod, you know, uh, I, I prayed to God and, you know, God. And then I start asking the question, okay, well, you know, did you accept Jesus Christ as Lord? Well, no, I, I didn't do that, but I'm just going to pray to God. See, you see, you have to understand you need to accept Jesus Christ as Lord to put your life under his instruction. Very important. A lot of people are just praying and just asking for good things from the universe because they deserve it when really they need to come to the Lord. And this is exactly what Ezekiel is saying. And God is saying this to Ezekiel. He's saying, tell them that a prophet from me has been among them. And so that's very important that we hear that. The word of God is the prophet today. Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 6 and 8 say, And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions, do not be afraid of their words. Do not be dismayed by their looks, though they are rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear it or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you, and do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Wow, that's amazing. God calls us to digest his word. Digest his word, that none of that is man's word, by the way. God calls us to digest his word, not that of man. We must hear the word of God rather than the words of man. This is important today. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, 
all these things. We got all these things. We're talking to each other. He said that, they said that, they said that, he said that. Stop it. We need to read the word of God. We need to read the Bible. We need to hear what God has placed. I know the, the Bible's on the internet, but the internet is such a place of distraction. We need to focus. So focus and learn to meditate again on what God said to us. Because the Lord knows our minds. He knows our minds create strange distractions. And he understands that we must keep ourselves to him. We must let ourselves be involved in his word. Well, chapter 2, verses 9 says, Now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me. And behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And then he spread it before me. And there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mournings, M-O-U-R-I-N-G, and woes. Very important. Because God makes past mistakes known. God makes past mistakes known. Why? We must read God's word and understand what is wrong before we can make it right. What is wrong before we can make it right. When you come to know Jesus Christ, you know, we don't come to know him and say, we don't come, okay, Lord, well, I'm a pretty good guy, Lord. You know, I, I do pretty good. I mean, I deserve to be in heaven. So, you know, I, you should come into my life. That's not how we do it. We come to God and we know that we are not good, that we are sinful. We are people who do not do good. And we are people who, who think wrongly. That's true. That's what the law says to us. And that's true. When we come to that point, and when we get to that place, then we say, Jesus Christ, be my Lord. I need you today. When we say that, then everything changes. That's very important. That attitude of coming to Jesus Christ is so important. So today, as we think this through and as we understand it, we need to remember, you know, we don't need to be some super high powered guy. We just need to be who we are and ask God to help us. Next time on Quick Study Television, we're going to study from Ezekiel 5 to 7. It talks about the Lord who strikes. What does that mean? Well, we'll talk about that and more because God doesn't change. All of that's coming next time on Quick Study. Ryan? Well, today we're exploring a supposed inconsistency in the Bible regarding King Jehoiachin, and here it is. Was King Jehoiachin released from prison on the 25th day of the 12th month, as Jeremiah 52, 31 records, or was he released on the 27th day of the 12th month, as 2 Kings 25, 27 records? Let's study. Bible skeptics attribute many errors, contradictions, and inconsistencies to the Holy Scriptures, claiming that it really is not the Word of God as it repeatedly claims. One of these supposed errors has to do with the date of King Jehoiakim's release from prison. In Jeremiah 52:31, we read that it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month on the 25th day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. However, 2 Kings 25:27 records that in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month on the 27th day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, released Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. 
Many believe these passages to be contradictory since they seemingly report two different days for Jehoiakim's release from prison. While Jeremiah records the 25th day of the month, 2 Kings records the 27th day. Many believe this to be a simple copyist mistake. However, when we examine these passages closely, we discover that there is actually no contradiction whatsoever. On the contrary, when these passages are taken together, they actually give more detail than might be expected. Pay attention to the details. Jeremiah says that on the 25th day of the month, the king of Babylon lifted up the head of Jehoiakim and brought him out of prison. While 2 Kings records that on the 27th day of the month, the king released Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. When we look at these passages closely, we realize that on the 25th day of the month, a decree was given to release Jehoiakim. However, he was not actually freed until two days later. It is obvious from the text that just as is the practice today, the orders had to be verified and paperwork had to be filed. In two days is not an unreasonable amount of time for this process. It's clear to see that when we put these two passages together, there's absolutely no mistake. Rather, there's more detail regarding this event than perhaps expected. While Jeremiah records when the decree was given for Jehoiachin's release, 2 Kings records the actual day that he walked out of prison. As I said in the segment, even today when someone is released from prison, it takes time to process that order and get all the paperwork filed. And two days is really not unreasonable. There is truly absolutely no reason to doubt that the Bible is the very words of God, just like it claims. Okay, so, so he's given the proclamation to be released. Um, and then several days later, he is released. Two and days so, later. Or two days later, he is released. Mm -hmm. So really, the Bible's just covering the difference in the two days. Exactly. That's all it's doing. Yeah, it's giving a little bit more detail, actually. And, and it's telling us that, you know, this is the reality. Now, actually, two days is really good because I know people who've been released on parole or whatever, you know, and two weeks later, they get out of prison. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really true. Yeah. And that happens today. That's very good, Ryan. Very good. And um, speaking of Jeremiah, oh, we yes. should have Corey talk about uh, Corey, what our did you do? Our offer. Our offer for this month is Introduction to Jeremiah. So last month we did an Introduction to Isaiah. Uh, this month we're doing an Introduction to Jeremiah. And what it is, uh, is it is uh, an hour and 10 minute long DVD. Half of it is a teaching done by myself that I introduce you to the time period of Jeremiah. Uh, the, these Old Testament prophetic books can be intimidating uh, mm -hmm. for people uh, even experienced people in the Bible uh, who have read the Bible many times coming up to these books of the Bible um, because you do need to know a little bit of your history, of your biblical history, in order to understand what's going on and to be able to figure out, you know, when this prophecy happened or why this prophecy happened and keep everything straight in your mind. So the first half of the DVD is a teaching dedicated to introducing you to the time period of Jeremiah mm -hmm. and what was going on in the world, what was going on in Jerusalem, uh, why was Jeremiah Jeremiah, where he was, and things like that. And then the second half is a roundtable discussion uh, where we, the cast of Quick Study, uh, go over some discussion points regarding Jeremiah and some of his specific prophecies. So if you would like to get a hold of your copy of Introduction to Jeremiah, um, this DVD, then write to us, call, or go online, and it's for a suggested donation of $25. Very good. And I can tell you this, that we talked about Jeremiah and him being down in Egypt, and that may have been the last time we saw him. And I, I'm sure, because I know for a fact, I'm sure that we'll get people saying, well, no, because this says that, that says this. The Bible does not say that, but we will answer, the, are you ready for the answer to that question? Write for this. It's going to be in there in the table section. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. <laughs> It'll be on there in the table section. Anyway, uh, <laughs> what did you do? Well, I took a look at the phrase that we read an awful lot. In fact, over 90 times in the book of Ezekiel. And that's the phrase, son of man. Now, you had mentioned to me earlier, we, we were talking about it. There are some Bible versions that say son of dust. But I'm going to take the phrase son of man for this particular time because we also need to distinguish that between the phrase son of man that Daniel uses in chapter 7, verse 13. Because the phrase here in Ezekiel refers to basically all of humanity. And also you would be able 
able to tell better from son of dust, obviously. It wasn't a demeaning term whatsoever. It was just a term referring to a member of humanity. But in Daniel 7, verse 13, it actually refers to, it's a me messianic terminology um, that was used in intertestamental Judaism and in the Gospels as well for Jesus Christ, That's the Messiah. So we, we need to distinguish that. When we read that in Daniel, it's not talking about son of man, meaning humanity, but it's the son of God. That's interesting. It really is. And of course, son of dust is something that came out of the early English. That's right. And the idea there was that he's not somebody who is excellent or great, well, but he's... He's we the, were formed out of the dust. Right. God formed man out of the dust. So but that was where that terminology came from. He was an exile. So he was living in the shadows of Babylon. Mm -hmm. So the Jews felt that the people in Babylon were in captivity. And so they felt that way about themselves. And so that's one of the reasons that people put that in. Very interesting. Uh, very interesting indeed. And, and one of the things that strikes me about Jeremiah is, okay. of course... You, and I like what you said yesterday. You, you know, Ryan said that he's going to get to heaven. He's going to look for him to hug. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, Jer There's a lot of rough stuff. Well, I mean, There's a lot of stuff. I mean, I mean, it's, yeah. Oh, poor guy. He, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, he's called the weeping prophet. And there's a lot of, you know, I mean, we've already studied him. But there's a lot of questions here. And there's a lot of concerns. And he's always, you, you never hear him except a few times in the scriptures. You never hear him really saying anything good. He's always prophesying evil mm -hmm. and bad things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and he is a contemporary with the prophet Ezekiel. So that's helpful yeah. to know as well. Yep. They were living mm -hmm. at the same time. Exactly. They were prophesying at miles the same apart, time. But, oh, yes. Yeah. Yep. A thousand miles, I think. Yeah, yes. and Jeremiah in Jerusalem <laughs> and Ezekiel in Babylon. So yeah. in the exile. So one was prophesying about the exile. One mm -hmm. was prophesying, well, he was also prophesying about the exile. But <laughs> we'll get well, into that. See, I mean, we'll get two, into it. The two prophets are really interesting because as you say, and as we've said, they're two different perspectives, and and really, um, it, you know, Ezekiel is exploring the the make of everything that God is doing, uh, why Jeremiah is explaining why they're there, and it's really interesting. And you know, God has explained things in His Word. One of the things He said, and and this is what I do every day. I, I tell you about Jesus Christ. And the reason I do that is because He's very personal to me. He is my Lord, and He is my Savior. I mean, the Lord. He saved my life, literally saved my life. And I was a preacher's kid. I mean, you know, and, and moved to 15 different states when I was a kid and all that, but God saved my life and changed me. My dad taught me how to read the Bible, but the Lord came in my heart when I said, Jesus Christ, come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Do that today.